live from Orlando, Florida, it's theCUBE. Covering ServiceNow, Knowledge17. Brought to you by ServiceNow. We're back in Orlando, everybody. Welcome, this is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. And we're here at Knowledge17. This is our fifth year doing Knowledge17. I'm Dave Vellante with Jeff Frick. Alan Leinwand is here, he's the CTO of ServiceNow, and he's joined by Carl Vanderpol, who is the, let's see, VP of Products, GM of Analytics, IT Business Management, uh, Sam, what, like VP of Other at, at ServiceNow. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, gentlemen, to theCUBE. Thanks so much for coming on. So, Carol, you guys were up today uh, at CreatorCon, had the big keynote, uh, talking about a, a really, we've been talking all week about the practical application of, of machine learning. So set it up, and we'll share with our audience sort of a bumper sticker of the, the, the keynote. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, the machine learning, well, we talked about the keynotes, like we're a very pragmatic company. Uh, actually, we pride ourselves on being very pragmatic. And we have to be, because um, we serve the biggest enterprises in the world, and their workflow relies on that. So when we talk about machine learning, there's a lot of hype out there. We, we are focusing on the things that are actually there today to increase productivity. Um, and and that's, that's exactly what we've been doing. So, um, and um, so yeah, yeah, again, you know, we talk about IoT and big data and natural language and there's, there's tons of stuff out there and some of it is real and some of it is not real. And so. Alan, the, the emphasis this morning in the discussion was really on simplifying you know, machine right. learning, embedding into the platform. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that was sort of the goal of, of putting it in the platform, was doing the DX continuum acquisition we did in January, and only taking the technology and embedding it in the platform. So it's just like all other pieces of functionality that developers love to use on the platform, and that is machine learning. It's something we call supervised machine learning, so it's a specific class. Like Carl says, it's not like driving cars and flying ships and Skynet or you know things like that. It's really all about taking specific data building a predictive model about it, and then people access that model in their applications, and really making their apps just smarter at the end of the day. Well, when you, you talk about DX Continuum, I remember Jeff and I, when we first were exposed to ServiceNow, walking around the ecosystem, we said, wow, there's a lot of companies here that ServiceNow could acquire, <laughs> and we asked Frank about it, we asked Fred about it, and both of them were consistent. You know, Frank said, we're not going to buy anything that doesn't you know, fit into the platform. Fred right. said the, the same thing, and you guys are, are pretty dogmatic about that. So when you think about an acquisition like DX Continuum, What's the process that you go through to sort of vet them, make sure that you can replatform? How does that all work? Yeah, we, we spend a lot of time internally thinking about that because you're right, what we don't want to do is build this Frankenstein sort of platform thing where you have- Franken now. Yeah, uh, Franken no. platform <laughs> or no Franken now. You don't have different silos of things you kind of cobble together because when you do that, you know, this one is on rev X and then this one's on rev Y and this one revs to X dot, X dot one and it doesn't compatible with Y dot two and you end up with this mess of things trying to all connect. So instead, we have a consistent data model, we have a consistent way of doing things, and when we are vetting companies, we look to see if we can take what they built and put it into our model. If it is completely orthogonal to how we built things, you know, we'll probably call a timeout on it and say we're not so sure that we really want to replatform this and move down that path, but we, we do spend a lot of time thinking about it. Carl's company at Mirror 42 was actually our first yeah. acquisition. And I remember being involved in that and getting him over the line and then getting him replatformed and built into our data model. It's had great performance improvements, better integration with our platform, and that's really the benefit we want to have for our customers. Yeah, I mean, I think, Jeff, you, you, yours was one of the first companies we saw, and I think we talked to you on the floor of, yeah, of One Knowledge. I remember that and then, in 2013. And then, wow, it was amazing. He had that's right. shoes, by the way. So he had wooden <laughs> orange <laughs> shoes. Yeah, yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. And, and caramel cookies. So <laughs> when it came to DX Continuum, from a product perspective, what was your, your angle there, and what was the discussion like? It's, it's exactly what Alan says. You know, we, we, we walk out on a lot of opportunities because we don't believe that we can replatform them or it's just too wide of a gap. So it's, it's like, can, you know, is the solution there? Is the technology there? Is there a direct fit with what, are, what we are doing? Um, and we look obviously at the team and then, and then the replatforming is a big part of the, of the due diligence. And you know, if, we, if, all those, if we tick all those boxes, uh, we'll move. And, and one of the most, um, the most important things after the replatforming is we see such rapid adoption of those acquisitions. So yes, you know, we'll delay the time to market. We will replatform first, which typically takes six to nine months. Um, 
um, with the XCOM team is actually really fast. It was really fast. And um, um, with analytics, it took a little bit longer first time, but yeah, six to nine months on average. But then after that, when you launch it, and, and especially with, you know, I think the, the, the parallel between analytics and machine learning, they're both engines. They're both engines that make every single app that we build on this platform better. Whether it's IT service management or HR, customer service, they both handle it from embedded from embedded analytics and embedded machine learning. So the adoption that you see um, in one or two years later after that acquisition is so well worth it. Um, so it's it's fine to wait six to nine months. We're not in a hurry with these things. We want to do it right. We want to make sure that it's enterprise and it scales, that it sits in an on-stop cloud, and that you know we're we're going to bake it in into everything that we do. Um, so so. A little bit more like due diligence up front, uh, but then the payoff is just you know ten times bigger. But I would imagine too part of the replatforming from the entrepreneur's perspective coming in is they kind of get a second chance, right? Yeah. They, they had the experience with with what they've built. They've got the team with which they've built it. Now they're kind of rebuilding it a little bit into the new platform, yeah. so they can you know maybe fix a couple things that uh, you know make some fix some mistakes from the early days. Never met an engineering team that didn't want to re-engineer re something and refactor <laughs> something. So giving them the chance to refactor it, and by the way, be closer to the cloud and actually closer to the bare metal and get the performance impact of doing that. You know, a lot of the folks that we partner with have generally integrated with us. So you talk right, to us right. over an API. You take that API away, you take that, that loose coupling away and put them right into the platform. Right, and then they're hardwired in. They're right? hardwired in and you know, they're in the matrix at that point and they're just, they're just wired in and away it goes. I want to ask you guys about this notion of machine learning on your instance only. Yeah. So guys at Wikibon, uh, we've been sort of advising our companies of, of you know, it's kind of a caveat emptor, beware the model. And let me set it up. So everybody says, every cloud company, it's your data. Okay, but your data is feeding a model and it's training a model. And so what's happening is the, the dividing line between the model and the data is getting very, very gray area. That's right. And then companies are taking that model and then they're using it for other companies. So how, our, our, you know, our, our concern is how do you protect your IP? Yes, it's your data, but if your data is feeding the model and your model is being used over here, well, you're giving your IP to your competitor and not even knowing about it. How do you guys address that? Yeah, sorry, I'm going to start. Yeah, well, I can start and you sure. can fill in. Um, no, that's exactly right. So, you know, just flat out, we don't do that. Um, we, we, <laughs> we, we really, you know, you have your data in your own database, in your own instance, and we do not co-mingle data. We, 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 we do not, we will not, and we only do that if you ask us to for benchmarking, for instance, and then we anonymize it. But for machine learning and building that training set, it really is training on the data of that customer and that customer only. So we're not going to aggregate. And there's actually another big benefit of that. The model that you then, the prediction model that you generate on your own data that, that, that flows for, you know, that serves your business processes and your workflows, Obviously, if you only train on your own data, you will get a prediction model that is optimized for your organization, your processes, and your workflows. So, um, it's, 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 the prediction model will be more accurate. Um, so, there's, there's benefits in it. I mean, there are use cases where you want to aggregate over everything. Um, that's just not us as a company. If you're Facebook or Twitter, you probably want to apply machine learning across all the tweets and all the posts. But for ServiceNow, we really look at, you know, the data for a single customer. Yeah, I, mean, I think you know that, Carl. I mean, the thing that we try to do is, we're not a consumer play, we're an enterprise play. Enterprises want to own their data, it's their data, it's their IP, to your point, Dave. You know, we're not building a data lake and then trying to like pick the droplets out that are relevant to you, right? We're building a set of information that's driven off your data that helps you drive decisions about your enterprise. So the canonical thing we talk about is, printer down for our CEO is probably a higher priority event than printer down for somebody else, right? So we need to think about how does that data actually get trained within the enterprise. Now, there might be other companies where printer down is critical for their business, because they're maybe a printing company. So but right. trying to disseminate that information when you aggregate that and you co-mingle that data, it has IP implications. It also has just relevancy implications. So if you're writing applications and you want to query an API or query a system, you want to know that that's going to be relevant to you. And if you're not using only your data, you're using like everything in the library, for example, to find a word, not that relevant at times. Right, and, and you mentioned Twitter and Facebook, are pretty safe bets because they're consumer, but sure. Amazon, Google, you know, we've been pressing those guys and we want to hear more from them, I IBM as well. Um, and they've been pretty forceful. They've, they've 
I think they're giving strong answers, but we want to see, see more evidence. I think you guys, with your architecture and, and the way you're applying machine learning in the models, actually is, is self-protecting. Right. Yeah. Right? The, architect, the multi-instance architecture has the benefit of not coming in lean data. So we would like, <laughs> we don't want to lead with our chin and say, well, for machine learning, we're now going to have coming all data. Right, it doesn't right. seem like a really smart way to enter the ring, right? Let's, let's talk a little bit about the, the cloud. We haven't talked much about your cloud this, Which this week. Which is interesting. Um, Three days, no talk of cloud. I mean, very so, little. So, yeah, you know, it's and when we first- to work now. You're doing such a good job. <laughs> well, that, well, when we first met ServiceNow, you know, it was, you know, we were observing all these hyperscale companies. We said, well, ServiceNow is kind of not really hyperscale, like an Amazon or a Google, but pretty big. And now you're seeing a lot of SaaS companies say, all right, we're going to run on Amazon. You see no, no, more than a handful. You guys are, again, pretty dogmatic about your cloud, sure. your application availability. So talk about, you know, maybe you could address that hyperscale thing. Uh, uh, are you, aren't you? I mean, does it matter? And, but more importantly, you know, why so dogmatic about your cloud? Um, isn't it more expensive? Why is it better for your business and your customers? Sure, sure happy to talk about that. So, First of all, at scale. I think what really matters is to make sure you have data for our customers in the right geographies. So, you know, we can have a contest about server counts and MIPS and bandwidth, but I don't really think that matters to enterprises. What really matters to enterprises is do I get the compute, storage, and networking needs to drive the application, to drive the workflow. Sure. So we're building things. We have, you know, 16 global data center regions. We continue to extend them. We continue to build out our footprint. And we continue to make sure that we have the resources to drive our customers' applications. Now in terms of you know, being dogmatic about doing our own, yeah we are. And the reason we are is because we think that when you leverage somebody else's infrastructure, one, you can't optimize it exactly the way you want. You can't get 10 gig pipes directly to your servers. You can't build out infrastructure to the networks you want. You can't get the storage ecosystem that you need to build in and do direct storage the way you want to do it. There's lots of little ways you sort of twist the knob on optimizing the cloud that really end up building a better product for the customer when you do it yourself. Generally, it leads to your point, Dave. People say, well, isn't it more expensive? And you know, at the end of the day is we spend a lot of time optimizing how we use the hardware. Now if we really just took a separate piece of silicon and aluminum and racked and stacked for every individual customer, yeah, that'd be a lot more expensive. But we spend a lot of time doing some of what we call capacity modeling and taking the servers and storage we have deployed and really fine tuning it for our customers' needs. And we found out that it's incredibly cost effective for us. So how much of the, for instance, 30%, if you have to take the, the contribution pie, when CJ stands up and says a 30 plus percent performance improvement, in Jakarta, yeah. How much of that is from you know code optimization versus cloud and the combination of the two? Uh, it's got to be the combination of the yeah. two. I mean, yeah. there's there's all these things we're doing. We're revving our hardware stack. We're always buying new hardware and server and storage for our customers, making sure we're on the leading edge of that. There's clearly some coding things that we've done as well, looking at new architectures on the UI, new architectures on the back end. You hear what we're doing metric based in order to store large amounts of data and very small data footprints. So it's a combination of all that that comes together that really is incredibly effective. So the, the inference is that if you were running on a, a public cloud, somebody else's public cloud, you wouldn't have been able to get maybe that much performance, get some performance, but maybe not as much. Is that a fair assertion? Yeah, I mean, the I way I say it, uh, when I talk to our teams about it, our customers about it, is we want to be able to draw a thread. We want to draw that thread from the application all the way down through the storage, into the network, all the way down to the racks and into the fiber. And we want to understand everything and optimize that, both for performance as well as cost and availability. So if you can't really do that, if you're working on an opaque public cloud right. where they won't even tell you where your servers sit. It really sounds kind of like Facebook, Facebook's description of their right. cloud, because it's one big application. And so they can optimize for IO, they can optimize for CPU, they can optimize for storage for, you know, because it's really just one big giant application that you can really tweak that hardware for your specific it, demands. It's, it's exactly service management, right? You know, we are, we, <laughs> it's end-to-end -end service. We, we have from beginning to the end. We do not outsource parts of the service and say, hey, you know, we're hosted somewhere else. We are responsible for end-to-end -end service for our customers, from code to performance to everything else in between. So, uh, I mean, it's, in a way, we're practicing what we're preaching. Uh, so, the, so, from the product guy's perspective, you don't get up someone and say, ah, I'm just going to do it, I'm going to spin up some EC2 today. <laughs> yeah, not a good idea. You better not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll talk, Carl. I mean, other than the fact that you get your butt kicked for trying to do that, but no, seriously, I mean, are there times where you'd say, ah, I just, I, I really can't get what I need out of my own cloud? Uh, honestly, I, I can't 
think of a, an example. I mean, mm -hmm. we've, um, the challenge that we also have is, you know, whenever you, imagine you would do that, right? You'd say like, I want to test something and we, and, and we would allow developers to spin up an EC2. And then they want to test it on real customer data. Like, uh -uh. Data doesn't leave our cloud. Yeah. So you couldn't do the same amount of testing, you couldn't do upgrade testing, you couldn't do performance tuning, you couldn't work with real, real customer examples. So, we're, because data doesn't leave our cloud. So, we basically, we only develop, well, we truly only develop, uh, when it comes to productizing, we only develop on And it's own. not a source of friction? No. In terms of, uh, no. Oh, okay. I was looking to follow up on your point, Jeff. I mean, if you look at all the biggest companies out there, right? Google, Facebook, you know, Salesforce, ourselves, we're doing it on our own, right? Right, right. right. Well, and you know, I, I mean, to the cost, question, if all you were doing was infrastructure as a service, right. I would say the future is bleak. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Because the marginal economics yeah. of Amazon is just, but to, to compete with those type of cost structures, you have to have value to right. up the stack, you have that value. And I would say the same thing, by the way, for IBM and, and Oracle and, and virtually any SaaS player who, right. who has the stomach to do what, what you guys are doing. And it's not easy work. It's not easy work, and the thing that's other advantage we have bluntly is we're such an amazing product and amazing ecosystem of customers that people want to come work on the cloud because you need the talent to do it. Right. I mean, there's clearly companies that don't have the talent to do it, and then they do just outsource, and that's perfectly legit. But if you do have the stomach to make the investment in the talent and the team to do it, you're just going to end up with a superior service. Okay. Uh, I want to switch subjects, software asset management, the biggest hoot of the week, the hoot <laughs> as in woo, 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 because there's always a big you know, clap. It's not a golf clap. You know, there's always <laughs> something that's super exciting that the crowd genuinely goes crazy for. That was software asset management. Now, let me set this one up. So you guys have been very you know, politically correct, talking about you know, some vendors and audit. I'm talk, I've written a lot about Oracle negotiations in my life, and for an Oracle customer, I think CJ gave the stat that 25% of a budget is, uh, is licenses. Many Oracle customers, and we've done hundreds of, of assessments of Oracle customers, sometimes it's high as two thirds to 75% of the budget is software license and maintenance costs. And, and Oracle in particular, but others, use audits as a weapon, a negotiating weapon, and they mop up the client base. Look at Salesforce, Salesforce did a billion dollar deal with Oracle, I guarantee there was an audit behind that. So, software asset management yeah. is a huge uh, opportunity for your customers and yourselves. Talk about what you announced and why it's important. Yeah, and uh, let me start with saying is like, well, you know, we would like to take credit for you know coming up with that idea, but we did not. <laughs> it was our customers who told us over and over and over and over again, we want you to get into the software asset management business. You own the CMDB. We have all the contracts in your system. We already doing asset. You, you, we also store the software assets in there. You got to help us normalize, reconcile, and optimize the software licenses, and. Um, so I think about you know 18 months ago we kind of took the decision and you know we looked at make or buy and 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 the replatforming was an issue so we decided to go you know on our own and we started building this um, and um, yeah with great success and I think we've we, this is probably the the best launch that I've seen uh, it's definitely better than the analytics launch which I was part of <laughs> which is the first time that we did this but. Um, uh, yeah, we're completely ready. We kind of know what to expect. So even the fact that you know we we, we got a big chair and the the labs and all the sessions were completely full, full house, people standing in the back, so a lot of interest. But we've already been working with some of these customers, so we know how good it is. We already had a, a panel, uh, so of design partners and customers telling how accurate and how helpful this was. Um, so it's exactly that. It's you know we're focused on Microsoft and, and Oracle in this first release for uh, protecting against audit. Um, we we normalize everything on the client side and on the server side. We have optimization packs for Microsoft and Oracle, and then you'll see us you know coming out with all the other ones, the you know, the other the, the IBM's, Adobe, VMware, Citrix, you name it. Um, so that that's going to follow on. So very exciting times. You also uh, announced cloud management. I'll give you another idea. Um, that we hear from a, a lot of customers, and you could maybe apply AI, machine learning, I wonder if you've encountered this, but AWS in particular, um, because it's such a popular you know, infrastructure as a service uh, provider, probably has, I don't know, 10 to 15 different data 
interfaces. So whether it's Kinesis, EC2, S3, Dynamo, DB, you know, Aurora, on, Redshift, on and on and on and on. Each is its own primitive API. Customers are very confused as to which one to use. Yeah. And they would love help in figuring out, okay, what's the, the best horse for the course and how can I optimize you know, my spend? Yep. Uh, and as, as opposed to looking at it at the end of the month and saying, ouch. So it strikes me when I was listening to some of the things that you guys were doing you know, this week, that that's another, one of the many problems that you could solve. Is, is that something, if I come to you as a ServiceNow customer with that problem, can you help me? Oh, yeah, we, we do with the cloud management platform, we don't necessarily help you build your app on Amazon, but we can build these things called blueprints. And the blueprints do describe the various primitives and how those primitives go together. Yep. And then once those applications and those puzzle pieces are put together into a full-on blueprint and launched into the cloud service, we do then gather all the costing information off that and then provide you a look at your spend across various different types of clouds, so we can do that. Now we're not going to say use RDS over here versus Redshift versus Glacier versus you know, S3 sort of thing. But you're going to make it easier for me to make that We're going to make it easier for you to make the mm -hmm. decision and we're going to show you the cost around that and then easier for you to replicate that decision so you don't have different teams go applying different blueprints to right. trying to build similar buildings. There's, I mean, there's so many, there's probably a thousand of examples like what I just gave you that yeah. in your custom base. Power of the platform, Jeff, right? Right, oh. absolutely. And All help right. people manage work, right? It's, just, it's, it's a pretty simple concept. And we're trying to make them build a work item called a blueprint and be able to use it and leverage it across multiple disciplines. Okay. And actually the two are a little bit related, like the cloud management, the software asset management. If you add in another uh, product that we, we, we added in Istanbul, application uh, portfolio management, think about it this way. It's like, you know, number one of the biggest priorities of CIOs is, you know, I got a thousand apps, I need to rationalize. Yeah, I need time. to pick a couple of platforms and I want to rationalize. That's really what APM is. And then when you rationalize, you're going to go either to the cloud, where cloud management comes in, and when you do, you need to you know, reclaim some of the licenses of the old stuff that you're getting rid of, or you need to optimize your licenses for the ones that you keep investing in. So, you know, although they're three separate products, you know, they're really part of that one single conversation of that, you know, tackling that one issue. It's like, okay, rationalizing the apps, are we going to the cloud, are we going to build them on platforms? What are we going to do, and how do we optimize the cost and, and be compliant? So it's, it's uh, sometimes they look like different products, but it's really not, it's one conversation. Right, right. All right, Jets, we have to leave it there. Thanks so much for Thank coming on theCUBE and coming on together. You know, I saw, we saw you on the keynotes this morning, so it'd be great, and uh, you guys are always excellent guests. Thanks so much. Thanks very All much. Right. Thanks, Jets. All right, welcome. Keep right there, everybody. We'll be back right after this short break. <laughs>